we are not given a great deal of insight into how Samuel developed in those early years at Shiloh when he was a young boy, only brief snippets. We do know that by the time we come to chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3, he will command the respect of all Israel because they will know that he is Yahweh's prophet, as verse 20 states. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be the prophet of Yahweh, which means God had been at work in his life right in the midst of this blasphemous center at Shiloh to raise him up to see that he was properly nurtured and instructed and prepared for his future work. But before leaving chapter 2, we need to recall the wicked works of Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Belial, only so that we can appreciate the environment, the circumstances out of which God was able to raise up his faithful high priest. They were blaspheming God's sacrifices. They were openly practicing immorality with the women who served at the tabernacle. They defiled the peace offering, the very offering that was intended to be a celebration of a family's time spent with God in fellowship to celebrate the good things that God had done in their lives. And they would forcibly take the best portion for themselves when it was raw because they tired of sodden meat so that they could enjoy a barbecue together with their father Eli. We know in chapter 2 that Eli is noted for both rebuking his sons on the one hand, but then getting fat off of the sacrifices that they denigrated. The man of God in chapter 2 specifically rebukes Eli for this in verse 29, where he speaks to Eli and says, Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat, literally and spiritually, in a negative way, and includes Eli in that sin. Make, thyself, make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. And, and we all know, the youngest of Sunday school scholars here know the, of the picture of Eli's death when he was a fat old man who fell off his chair and broke his neck. How did he get to that condition? Because of the abuse of God's sacrifices, taking the choice parts that belong to God. He had abused the special privilege that God had established in the high priest back in the days of Aaron. And he is rightly condemned in verse 27. Thus saith Yahweh, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest and to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? And Eli, you have taken this privileged position and you have used it for your own advantage. And then you have taught your sons to do the same. Instead of being the model of holiness unto Yahweh, that the high priest was intended to be, was designed to be, was to model for the nation, instead of separating from the evil, Eli and his sons were condoning evil. They had dismissed the standard of holiness so that the priesthood and the sacrifices that were designed by God to save people and that were supposed to teach people about the bondage to sin, which I think is why the man of God makes reference all the way back in the days of, of Egypt when our fathers were in bondage in the house of Pharaoh. God appointed Aaron and the priesthood to show how we can come out, we can be freed from the house of, of Egypt, the house of sin. And, and instead of encouraging the repentance and the confession of sin and the need for forgiveness and a transformed character which the priesthood and the sacrifices were designed to teach. 
Instead of that, Eli and his sons promoted sin. They mocked the need for forgiveness. They mocked the need for a transformed character. So consequently, as we know, the man of God in verse 30 tells Eli that the priesthood would be taken from him and God would raise up another prophet. Wherefore, Yahweh, God of Israel, saith, I said indeed that thy house, the house of thy father, shall walk before me forever. But now, Yahweh, saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me, the Hebrew word means to disesteem. You see, Eli was disesteeming God by his actions. It's not that he didn't know God, but he was not reverencing God. He had something else in his life that was more important than God. And in this case, he was honoring his sons instead of God. They that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thy house. And Eli's persistent wickedness, God says, will result. Because of your wickedness, it will result in the Philistines capturing the ark. And Eli, you're going to see it. And Eli, you're going to bear responsibility for it. The man of God does not appear to the sons of Eli in chapter 2. He appears to Eli. And he lays the responsibility for what is happening at Shiloh at the feet of Eli. You were given these blessed privileges, and you have abused them. Verse 32, thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the sign that this would come to pass is that both, so both sons, in verse 34, would die on the same day. It, it takes a man especially enslaved to sin, to hear the prophet's rebuke and condemnation and do nothing about it. To make no changes, to take no steps, to alter no outcome, to simply hear the words of condemnation and to continue on in his sins. There is no evidence that Eli responded in any way to the condemnation he heard from the man of God. Such was the character of Eli. And he stands as a warning, brethren and sisters. Eli is another one of those Bible characters like Saul, like Ahab, like Haman, in which I am so easily and readily prepared to dismiss. But that's not why these events are recorded. If you're anything like me, I find myself far more like Eli in these stories than I do Hannah and Samuel. That's why he stands as a warning to all of us. We can live in an environment in which we are surrounded by the things of God. We can have ready access to the Word. We can know God's will, both His will regarding the coming kingdom and His will for us to be part of it. And we can know that he has called us to a special life, a special life of service. He has predestined us. He has marked us out in advance to be conformed to the image of his Son. And we can know that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is ever so near. We can know it all and have access to it all and be surrounded by it all. And yet having all this, we can become just like Eli and fail to make the changes in our life that God is looking to have us make, that we know from God's Word we need to make. We can sit here this weekend and reflect upon these lessons in the lives of these wonderfully faithful people, and we can compare ourselves to their example 
And we can identify in our lives or in our families or in our ecclesial life changes that we know we need to make. And we can walk away and make no changes. I can just about guarantee if God works in your life like he works in my life, at special weekends like this, when we reflect upon his word in the quietness of our own chair, and we hear the principles of God's word expounded, and we reflect upon our own walk, and we recognize in a conversation with our own conscience before our God, there's an area that I need to change. There's an area of my life that I know is not in step with his word. He will give us opportunities within 24 to 48 hours to make those changes. He will. That's how he works in my life. To see whether or not I am sincere and genuine, or if it's all just words. He desperately wants to save us, brethren and sisters. He does. He does. And he will do all he can to save us. And he will open thoughts for us. And he will bring principles to light for us to encourage us to grab a hold of them and to seek his help to make the changes we need to make. But he won't force us. He will only provide opportunities and then step back to see whether or not our heart is sincere. Eli's heart was not sincere. He did nothing to make the necessary changes. When he knew and been specifically rebuked that they were needed. He made no changes because he is portrayed in Scripture as being a hearer of God's word and not a doer. So you go back to verse 22 of chapter 2 and 23 and 24 and three times it talks about how Eli heard. Verse 22, he was very old and he heard all that his sons did. Verse 23, why do you do such things? For I hear of all your evil doings. Verse 24, nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear you make Yahweh's people to transgress. He hears of his son's wickedness. And he will, he will verbally chastise them in chapter 2, but he will go no further than the verbal rebuke. The rebuke of the man of God shows that he was not good at acting upon what he heard. And that's why the, the, uh, the Apostle James says that those who hear but do not do the word are self-deceived. Eli was self-deceived. And, and you know, what a contrast with this wonderful woman, Hannah, who not only knew God's will, but then was so aligned with it that she could pray and sing and make a vow that were all in complete harmony with God's will. The sad fact is that Eli knew the truth and he could teach the principles of the truth to others, but he couldn't bring himself to live what he knew. And no doubt his sons could see right through the hypocrisy of Eli, on the one hand being the high priest, but on the other hand enjoying the sins just as they were. And, and you know, the lesson for us as fathers, we can't just be teachers of God's truth in our home. Our, our children can't just see us as teachers. They need to see us living the truth. They need to see that the principles that we talk about around the dinner table the principles that we bring to bear when we rebuke them when they have done something wrong, these are principles that we live by, not just that we rebuke by. It should not be lost upon us that Eli rebukes the, his sons for wrong conduct in verse 25 of chapter 2. And then in verse 27, the prophet, the man of God comes and Eli has rebuked his son, saying, you know, you're not worthy of being priests because there is no mediator for one who sins against God the way you're sinning. And then two verses later, the man of God comes in verse 27 and tells Eli the exact same thing. You are not fit to be priests 
but he couldn't put these things together. He couldn't make the changes that he needed to make. Vigilance for holiness and righteousness must begin in the home, not in the lives of others. And if it needs to begin in the home, brethren, it needs to begin with the head of those homes. Which is why, as we know in the New Testament, the deacons and the bishops, one of the qualifications is whether or not we are establishing righteousness and holiness in our homes. And we are holding ourselves accountable to it. And we are sanctifying ourselves before we turn around and, and attempt to sanctify our wives and our families. Only those who are doing that says Paul to Timothy, are fit to be servants in the ecclesia of God. But we know the uh, rebuke and the prophetic message of chapter 2 does not end without hope. In Eli's place, God would raise up a faithful priest who would do God's will and serve the Messiah forever. And, and no doubt the fulfillment of verse 35 in its ultimate sense, where he says, I will raise up I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in mine mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. No doubt that its ultimate fulfillment will be seen in the kingdom. But as we saw yesterday, as in the case with so many prophecies in Scripture, there is this initial fulfillment. Eli, you are going to be immediately replaced. You and your household will be taken out of the picture. And that immediate replacement that faithful priest that God would raise up. As Brother Roberts notes in the ways of providence, that faithful priest would be Samuel. And chapter 3 of 1 Samuel will now explain to us. In verse 35, we're shown that a new faithful priest would need to be raised up by God to replace Eli. And chapter 3 identifies who that faithful priest will be. We mentioned it yesterday. It was rather quick. We don't want to miss the fact you know, connect the dots here between Hannah's vow in verse 15 of chapter 1, and what she declared her son would be a lifelong servant of God, and her declaration in verse 22 of chapter 1, the baby is three months old. If she conceived at the time that her vow was made, the child is born, the annual visit, the year later, Elkanah says it's time to go to Shiloh, and Hannah says, I won't be going now until the child is weaned. She makes her declaration when she has this lovely three-month-old boy that he will be a servant in the house of God forever, and God comes along at the end of chapter 2 and endorses her vow and her declaration. God would raise him up, as verse 35 of chapter 2 says. He will be God's faithful priest, and he will do all that is in God's heart and mind. We don't know how much time passes between chapter 2 and chapter 3. Surely there was sufficient time for Eli to do something about the rebuke he had received. Samuel, we know, is still a young boy, and he sleeps nearby to Eli in the tabernacle. They have a loving and an affectionate relationship. You can see it evidenced by what happens that night and by Samuel's response. But in chapter 3, God will put his divine stamp of approval upon Samuel. And he does so in such a dramatic fashion that by the time these events are concluded and then reported to the nation as they would have been, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that God has selected Samuel for a special role in Israel. In the place of Eli, God would raise up a faithful priest whom God could rely upon to speak his heart and his mind so that the events of chapter 3 reveal the identity of this faithful priest and just how trustworthy he was to speak God's word. You see, without these events, Samuel has no divine credibility. And how can he down the road act as a priest or a prophet, or in any capacity. He's not in the right lineage of Aaron to be a priest. Maybe he can be a doorkeeper, but why is he taking such authority upon himself? But after the nation hears the events of chapter 3, 
and how God has established the credibility of this young boy, no one, no one will question his credentials. They will all know that this is Yahweh's prophet and priest. And when this man speaks, God speaks. In chapter 2, we know there was a sharp contrast between Hophni and Phinehas and Samuel, and the record goes back and forth, contrasting the two. In chapter 3, the contrast is between Samuel and Eli. And by the end of this chapter, the events will reveal that he has surpassed even Eli in God's eyes. Because the time has arrived for Samuel to begin a new level of service, even at a very young age. And the marvel of this is that it all happens when he is still a child, verses 1 and 8 tell us in chapter 3. He's probably only around 12 years old. I don't think we can substantiate one way or the other. But he is certainly young enough to where when he hears a voice in the middle of the night, he runs to Eli. He could have been younger, we don't know. There's marvelous comparisons between he and the Lord Jesus Christ at this point when he was 12 and went into the temple. All we know for certain is he is a young man, a very young man. He's called a child. And they share, the two do, a loving relationship that you would expect between a 12-year-old and a 93-year-old high priest. You see, for all his failings as high priest, Eli is still portrayed as having a positive spiritual influence on Samuel up to this point. He would unquestionably take in a fondness to this boy. The boy was a miracle sent from God. He knew his background. He, he, he was told by Hannah when he was brought to the, temp, to the temple at the age of three, four, and five, that wonderful beginning of Samuel's life. And then he has watched Samuel grow in favor with God and men. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says, The child Samuel ministered unto Yahweh before Eli. So there is much good that comes out of this relationship. And the ministering work that Samuel is doing under Eli's direction. No doubt Eli was able to teach Samuel about the law and temple worship and duties of a priest. You see, God can use a hearer of the word to teach. He can up to a point, but not beyond that point. So God could use Eli in this capacity to help instruct Samuel. But the time has arrived when that relationship now needs to be severed. We know in those days that the word of God was precious, it was valuable. It was in short supply. The RSV and the RV margin says it was rare. Doesn't mean it was highly valued. It means it didn't exist. Shiloh is in shambles. The apostate priesthood is there. God is no longer speaking through Eli, which is evident by the events of this chapter. There's no open vision. There's no divine communication being re received by God. He has stopped communicating with Israel. The prophecy revealed to Samuel that, that night, you see, was critical to Samuel's understanding, as young as he was. This is not new information that is uh, conveyed by God through Samuel to Eli. He had told Eli back in chapter 2 what was coming. And then when the angel appears to Samuel in chapter 3, he says, I've already told Eli these things, but now, Samuel, I want you to know these things. So in verse 13... The angel tells Samuel that God had already revealed these things to Eli. But in chapter 3, it will be important for Samuel to hear from God about the divine judgment that is coming and why it is coming. It will be important for Samuel to understand that Eli and his household have become utterly astray from God's holiness and they must be removed. And God will reveal to young Samuel that it is time to move beyond Eli in your life. This man who no doubt Samuel loved deeply. There is no hope for this man. 
not because of his sins, but because of his unwillingness to repent of his sins and to change his ways. The events that night for Samuel we know would have been spectacular. In verse 7, it says that Samuel did not yet know Yahweh. Neither was the word of Yahweh yet revealed unto him. It doesn't mean that he didn't know who God was. He's been ministering unto Yahweh since the earliest of days. What hasn't existed is God has not worked through Samuel up to this point. But he will after this point. Three times. The angel calls to Samuel. And the reason, I think it's the three times, is that God is waiting. He's waiting for Eli to figure out that God is now communicating with Samuel. Because as soon as Eli figures out that it's God who's calling to Samuel, and he tells Samuel, the next time you hear the voice, Respond that you are ready to hear and do. God appears to Samuel. So that the next morning there will be no doubt in Eli's mind that God has conveyed his message through this young boy. You see, if God had, had bypassed Eli that night, imagine Samuel coming the next morning. The message is so horrific that it's doubtful that Samuel would have shared it. But Eli knows that God has spoken to Samuel. Without Eli's testimony and witness to these events, who in Israel would believe a 12-year-old boy and the incredible story of this 12-year-old boy that an angel came and appeared to him in the glory of God in the middle of the night? But because these events were orchestrated the way they were, God used Eli's own testimony to establish the credibility of Samuel. It's a sobering revelation to Eli that God is no longer going to speak through him. He is now speaking directly through this 12-year-old boy. What Samuel saw that night was nothing short of spectacular. It wasn't just a voice he heard. Verse 15 speaks of the vision that Samuel heard that night or saw that night. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of Yahweh. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. In verse 10 it says, Yahweh came and stood. The angel was right there with Samuel. If you don't have the reference in Psalm 99, it's worth having marked because the indication, we can't be certain, but the indication is there. It strongly infers that Samuel saw God's glory that night. And it cuts through all the questions that those in Israel might have had. Who is this 12-year-old boy? And where did he get his credentials? God is telling him right up front on the day of the inauguration as it were, of his work as a prophet. I have already revealed my glory to this boy. It would take away all the questions about Samuel's credibility. The word of God may have been rare in that day with no open vision to Eli, but Samuel is shown a vision of God. And God is showing that Samuel belongs in the same category as Moses and Aaron. He will be a special, special person in God's plan. The message of condemnation that Samuel hears that night is that God had judged Eli and his household and was about to destroy it. And again, the commendation and the reasons for it are directed against Eli just like we saw in chapter 2. The man of God came and condemned Eli. In chapter 3, God is condemning Eli through the words of Samuel. Yes, the sins of the sons are atrocious, but the reason for God's condemnation of Eli is not because of the sin's conduct alone. 
It's because Eli knew what was right, and he knew that what they were doing was vile, and he did nothing to restrain them. Verse 13 is the commendation. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sins, his sons, sorry, made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for. That's what the Hebrew word is, kafar. There will be no atonement. The house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. They had reached the point of rebellion in which they had placed themselves beyond the umbrella of forgiveness. That's the warning to, to, uh, to Eli. His actions and the actions of his sons and Eli's refusal to do anything about it had caused him to be placed outside the umbrella of forgiveness. There's only two other references that I'm aware of in Scripture when people are told there is no forgiveness for your sin in the Gospels. If you saw the work of God through the Lord Jesus Christ and you declared in your heart that this was all of Beelzebul, that blasphemy would put you outside the umbrella of forgiveness. In Hebrews 10, if you were a Jewish believer and you chose to go back to the law of Moses and forsake the Lord Jesus Christ, that would place you outside the umbrella of forgiveness. We need to be clear here. God isn't saying that Eli is being condemned for his son's sins. They bore their own guilt. God does not hold us accountable for our children's sins, but he does hold us accountable for how we respond to them. Eli was winking at their sin by failing to take right steps to restrain them. He had words with them, but he did not restrain them. Which is why Eli stands as a warning, not just to fathers and parents, but to all disciples. He held a very prominent position, and he could have done much good for the nation. But his life is summed up, summed up in a single phrase. There was no covering, no purging of his sins forever. Forgiveness, brethren and sisters, is a wonderful, wonderful blessing. It is exactly what we need when we find ourselves in a situation of sin. There is no other alternative. There is no better path than what God has provided in this wonderful blessing of forgiveness. But there is a limit to God's willingness to forgive. It is not unconditional and it is not unlimited. He forgives us for, with a purpose. And he forgives us with an expectation that we will forsake the evil and seek to restrain its influences, which is why we read in Proverbs 28, verse 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth his sins and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And, and God forgives us, as we know, to return us to righteousness and, and to keep us from being overwhelmed by the guilt of the sins that we commit. But if we take his mercy for granted and presuppose upon his grace, as Eli and his sons were doing, the scripture warns us that we are left outside the covering for sin. And, and lest we think for a moment that somehow God was being too harsh upon Eli, when Samuel has to convey to him in the morning that you have placed yourself, Eli, in God's estimation, and in God's just judgment and his assessment, you have placed yourself outside the umbrella of forgiveness. God had been very, very gracious to Eli in giving him time to repent. He sends him the man of God in chapter 2 who lays out specifically and clearly in unmistakable terms where Eli's sins existed and what God was going to do about it, and Eli did nothing. And then God, in his mercy, takes the one person at Shiloh 
that was a representation of all that was good in the truth. This young boy, who Eli knew existed from the time before his conception, and who had come to Shiloh, and had been instructed in the things of God, and had embraced the things of God, and he wore the coat, the little linen ephod, that represented the, the future priesthood potentially. Eli saw all of this. He would have loved Samuel and seen Samuel as this small embodiment of all that is good. God uses that boy to send a message into Eli's life that Eli is condemned. And Eli will do nothing about it. You see, that's the God we worship. He desperately wants to save us. He will eventually bring those closest to us to bring the message of the need to repent and change. And God works through this wonderful young boy in appealing to Eli one last time. But it is all unsuccessful. But don't overlook the fact that the God we worship will do everything in his power to appeal to us, but he won't force us. And that's why Eli comes to, re to symbolize the rejected class, those who have placed themselves outside the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sadly, when we open chapter 4, what do we find? that Eli is still permitting his sons to do as they will and to abuse God's truth and to take the ark into battle in a capacity it was never intended for. And he will hear of what they've done and by then it's too late. So come with me now if you would to 1 Corinthians 11. As we Consider the power of this ritual that God has commanded that we participate in. We know in 1 Corinthians 11 that the focus of Paul's comments, beginning in verse 27, is on self-examination leading to a confession of sin. Read verses 27, 28, and 29 to yourself. And look for the three words that God uses to warn us regarding the seriousness of self-examination and those who fail to do it properly. Unworthy, guilty, and damnation. And then in verse 30, what are the two words that God uses to describe his assessment of a person who fails to properly examine themselves? Spiritually weak and spiritually dead. See, what Paul is addressing, as we know in this chapter, is the lack of self-examination which was leading some at Corinth to be both spiritually weak or spiritually dead. And the reason for that is because of they, were, they were failing at this point in the service to examine themselves properly, properly. It is not coincidental that on the one hand, Eli and his sons were abusing the sacrifices of Yahweh. And on the other hand, they had placed themselves outside of the boundary of forgiveness. In their case, it was with animal sacrifices. In our case, it can be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot abuse this sacrifice. We cannot disregard it or disesteem it or fail to hold ourselves accountable for how we have lived in examining ourselves on the one hand and then turn around and expect God to be gracious to us.
And, and the reason this expectation is established is because known sin that is left unexposed and unconfessed and unrepudiated is sin that cannot be forgiven. There's no safeguard for one who fails to examine himself properly. God places that squarely on the shoulders of each of us. We can't examine each other. That has to exist in the heart and the mind of each disciple. And he warns us, before we can avail ourselves of the benefits that come from participating in the memorial table, we must examine ourselves and confess our sins and expose our sins. Because we know the self-examination process is not just to expose the sins, but then to take the steps to make the commitment, to make the needed corrections. And that's why God uses this crucial step of self-examination to save us. Because if we are unwilling to hold ourselves accountable for our walk, there's nothing God can do. We place ourselves outside of the umbrella of forgiveness and salvation. We know in Hebrews 4, for concluding comments, that there is a proper way to examine ourselves. It's the context of Paul recounting how Israel failed to enter the rest because of unbelief. Verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And then he describes in verse 12 that process we know well, how the word should be active in our minds and our hearts. It should be quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And, and the adjectives that Paul uses, if Paul in fact is the, is the author of, uh, of Hebrews, they're unmistakable. Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's able to discern the thoughts and the hearts. See, God wants us to fully expose our sins to ourselves. He wants us to hold us ourselves accountable, both in what we do and what our motives are. There's great wisdom when we do this, brethren and sisters. It's exactly what the situation needs. When we go through this process of self-examination and holding ourselves accountable and exposing our sins, the sinner is humbled, as he should be, and his conscience is cleansed, exactly what the sinner needs. Sin is repudiated and condemned as being wrong, exactly what sin needs. And God's righteous ways are once more exalted. It's the perfect divine solution to sin. And with our sins open and laid bare, and our ugly blemishes fully exposed and revealed, what do they need? What do we need in that situation? We need a faithful high priest who can forgive all of those blemishes and present us faultless before God. Seeing then in verse 14 that we have such a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, let us hold fast our profession. Such a high priest is exactly what a sinner who is full of blemishes needs. But the value and the saving work of the high priest only is accessible if the sins are first exposed. And it's worth noting that in the Old Testament, the only acceptable way to approach God was with a sacrifice without blemish to typify the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the need to maintain holiness as our standard of conduct. In the New Testament, the only acceptable way of approaching our God is with our blemishes fully revealed and fully acknowledged and fully exposed. Then, the high priest's work can be valuable to us. 
the danger we face, as we all know, is to let the magnitude of the high priest's great forgiving work cause us to minimize our need to confess our sins. And Paul's warning in this context in Hebrews is that we will not enter the promised rest if we fail to be sincere in this exposing of our sins using the principles of God's word. There's great wisdom in this. This is exactly what we need. God needs us to continue to confess our sins because it continually keeps before us that sin is the great enemy in our life. We remain engaged in the battle against it and we continue to strive to overcome it. We never make peace with it. And God is quite willing to forgive us even though we sin and we confess our sins and he forgives us and we sin and then confess our sins and he forgives us again and again and again and again. And he's quite willing to do so because we are staying engaged in the battle against sin. And we are holding ourselves accountable through our self-examination. At some point in their life, Eli and Hophni and Phinehas stopped confessing their sins. They stopped fighting the battle. They stopped holding themselves accountable to God's righteous ways. Before we now partake of the emblems, let us be diligent and thorough in examining ourselves that our sins will be exposed, but that we then may come boldly under the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, 
and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on World News events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation, so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.